right, let's get started. Welcome, welcome everyone to our community call. We're excited to be able to give you guys a sneak peek behind the curtain about leaking DOIs, as well as letting researchers earn open science badges. Um, I guess we'll start out by introductions because uh, I don't think I've met everyone. Hi, my name is Mark. I am the uh, product owner for OSF registries. So essentially, whenever someone has a question about registries, they kind of come to me and either I can steer them in the right direction, learn about what some of the pain points are, and try to make sure that we can uh, connect with the different communities and be able to reach their goals when they're trying to pre-register and register their, their research studies. And today to kind of help me with our conversation and our little preview is my friend and colleague, John. John, would you mind giving me a quick little introduction not to put you on the spot? Hi, uh, yeah, my name is John Walls. I am the uh, senior backend engineer on this project. So I'm here to kind of give a demonstration of how the APIs work when we get to that point and to answer any questions about that piece. Awesome, thank you. Um, speaking of which, to kind of get some of our kind of the basic rules during the session, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A, and we will make sure that we address them at the end of the demonstration. Um, as we put out in the emails, this demonstration is being recorded, and we will disseminate this after the call is done. Um, anytime that we're answering questions such like that, we'll probably end up cutting out that part or and also try to remove any other kind of like a little anomaly. So everyone will be getting a free recording of this um, once we're done with the presentation. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, to kind of go ahead and begin, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, as a quick little um, primer, this is currently on our staging. It's not on production, even though it may look like it. We're on a staging server. So everything that you'll see is kind of being done behind the scenes. It's not been pushed out. But it kind of gives us a really great example of what it's going to be like when it's actually put onto production where all researchers um, and partners just like you will be able to start using it. So let me go ahead and share. Great. So to kind of get started, I want to go a little bit page by page so that way we can all get acclimated this together. Um, first off, the, what you're seeing right here is a registration overview page. I'm assuming most people might be familiar with pre-registration, but if not, it is essentially putting out your study pre um, protocol or data analysis plan, so that way um, you are kind of transparent and rigorous about what you're trying to study and that you're being honest and that you're being creditable. So it's essentially just like whenever you start putting it towards a grant, it's the same thing, but instead of just giving it to that funder, you're actually putting it open to the public. All right, with that being said, um, one of the favorite things that your researchers and people you interact with, uh, whether your institution, preprint, or registry, is we're going to have this nice little call out saying, hey, we have a new feature. We think this is a great opportunity for us to start using these types of pop-ups to really introduce uh, new types of workflows and anything that we kind of refine or that we edit or add on. So with this one, it kind of points out to resources. Resources is a new tab that is going to be accessible on our um, on registrations and that's exactly what we're going to be digging into because that's where you can start linking uh outputs whether that it's data code um publications etc you can now be able to put all that in resources and you can link them through a doi and i will show you that in a second uh, the reason we're going with dois is because one they're permanent which means no matter whatever happens, it will always be accessible. And we want to make sure that when it comes to registrations, things have permanence and that they are properly archived. And also two, it now gives researchers the flexibility to link things both on and off of OSF. So if they have a, another registration that has data in it, they can just take that link, put it in there, and people can access it all in that single place. Same thing if they have data or files on Zenodo, they can get a DOI and link it directly towards their uh, pre-registration. That way, everything is housed in one single point. So your research, all you have to ask your research teams and your collaborators is saying, give me your DOI for your registration, and you can access it, all that information right from here. 
And it just really helps with making sure that people are being open and transparent, but also encourages compliance, which has been a big buzzword here as of late these last couple of years, making sure that research teams and others are being compliant with their work. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started into this. I'm gonna go ahead and click on got it, and let's dig into resources. As you can see, I already have a couple of resources here. And let's say that I'm a researcher and I wanna add in another piece of DOI. I have another data set that I, that I need to include because I did I, uh, not like almost like a replication, but also I built up on it. So to do that, you would click that little plus button right there. And we had this formatted so that way they can put in a specific type of um, like a DOI. Every, every single DOI has a format and we wanna make sure that we can help them put in the right format that's easily accessible. So with this one, I'm just gonna go ahead and click this. Uh, resource type, we have several. So our first one is data. We have analytic code, materials, papers, and supplements. And these are the first five we're gonna start out with with this initial release and the ones that we're gonna pushing for. If there are others that you might think of, please let us know. We will discuss this with our own um, top committee as well as our badge committee and see exactly where we can go with that. Again, these badges are intended to, to help you to encourage open science best practices. So I said, I was gonna click data. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And you can provide a description. The DOI and the resource type will always be required. So researchers will always need to put that in. Description is optional, and this can be as detailed as the researcher wants. So for this one, I can put something along the lines of, this is an, let's put an addendum for my I don't know, previous data. All right, so once I'm done with that, you will click preview, and it just gives the researchers another opportunity to make sure everything's accurate, make sure everything's okay. And for me, yep, and I will click add. And then boom, I have another piece of data right here. So it's that easy. Let's say that I accidentally did not check the data and I need to change it. It's also very simple. I can easily click edit, go back in, change it to whatever I need to, click save, and it'll automatically update. Every single time when a user updates their DOI, we validate those DOIs to make sure that they actually exist. So even though there's a small like, little typo and that DOI doesn't exist, it will check and say, hey, you may wanna come back here and make sure this is accurate. Um, but if it checks out, it'll be go ahead and it will go on through. It's just another way to make sure that um, the information that researchers are putting in is accurate. For me, I'm gonna cancel. And there's also the opportunity to delete it. And that's to help make sure that what if it's with the wrong project or they end up putting something they didn't because for human, we make mistakes. You can easily delete them as well. So that's easy clicking delete, verifying, make sure that this cannot be undone. So there's no undo and then click delete. That easy. So if I was a funder and I wanted to check compliance, all I have to do is go to this registration, click resources, and here's everything that I would need. Um, secondly is, actually before I get into that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and let John talk a little bit about the API because all of these materials will be available through our API if that's the way mode that you like to go. So with John, I'm actually going to pitch it over to you. All right, uh, do I have screen sharing permission? Let's find out. So starting from the same registration that Mark was looking at, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with any of our APIs. Some of you probably are, some of you probably aren't, uh, but they are all publicly accessible. So we can look at this registration by going to API. Uh, staging 2.0.sf.io slash v2 uh, registrations and then the GUID. And from here, uh, we can see all kinds of information about the registration. Uh, notably, we have added some of these values for these different types of resources. So every registration will tell you at the very top level if it has resources added for each of the five types data, analytic code, materials, paper, supplements. Uh, There we go. 
So if we go down into the relationships, which is the thing that all of these OSF uh, API entities have, we can discover the resources. Actually, the easiest thing to do by far, okay. So you can link, find the link here, or you can literally just type resources at the end. Um, so, you know, if you're doing this programmatically, uh, you would find the link in that relationship field of the big return JSON blob. If you're exploring through the browser, uh, you would just go to resources. And that will give you the list of all of these resources. Um, so we can see each one tells you the type. It tells you the PID. We use the PID term uh, PID for persistent identifier generically as opposed to DOI because we do have a goal of supporting more identifier types than just DOIs in the future. Uh, you can see, again, the registration that it's linked to and any description that's provided. And that, this will give you the full list for all of these things. Uh, we also have the ability to just look at the resource individually and we build a RESTful APIs. So if you want to do any manipulation through the API instead of through the front end, um, you can send requests to this uh, URL with the information that you want to update in order to make updates to it. The other notable thing is that, as I showed you before, we have those fields on the registration for as data, et cetera. And those are all filterable. So you can look at the full list of all the registrations on the OSF and find only the ones that have each type of uh, this information. So this query will give you all of the registrations that have associated data, and you can do that for any of these things. Let's do analytic code as another example. And that will give you just the registrations in the system that fulfill this criteria. Probably the most interesting stuff so far. I will happily answer more questions if they come up later. All right. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Uh, one thing to kind of follow up on is those are only pertainable to public registrations, not embargoed, because only public registrations are accessible through the API, as well as when you're searching for them through OSF registries. Um, so if you have a, a, if you're a partnership with one of those things where you can't access um, embargo registrations, then that might be a limitation. However, if you're, for example, an OSF registries moderator, you have access to both. So that might be something that would be helpful for you. All right, I wanna go back to sharing my screen real quick because I wanna talk about one other thing, which is going to be what we're calling open practice resources, which are essentially almost our badges and kind of a loose term called stamps. So if you are unfamiliar with those, um, badges were introduced in approximately, I think about 2014, if my memory serves me correctly, as a way to incentivize research teams to share the material specifically with data to help reduce our uh, replication uh, crisis that we, that we were experiencing. And the psychology science, um, psychological science journal found that that actually encouraged open sharing, especially with data by about 33%. And that's something that we want to encourage as more and more journals start adopting these factors. But we wanted to go a little bit beyond that and say, how else can we use these? And a great example is also those with institutions, funders, um, other kinds of organizations that are like research teams, et cetera. So we want to really be able to maximize that to incentivize us and encourage it. And that's exactly what you're seeing, not only on this page, but also over here that you'll be able to access on the overview and resource pays page of the registration. I'm gonna go back to the overview just to make that a little bit easier to scan. But as you can see, we have five different items here, but there's a slight little distinction. We have data that is a open science badge, which is when it's put in an open repository, wherever they add data as a resource, they look at this badge. Same thing with materials. Materials has been a badge that we've had since 2014 as well, just like data, and you get it about the same way. But we've added a new badge here in the last couple of months called analytic code. This is the code that you use to analyze your data. So not code that you would use for such example, building software and stuff like that. 
Um, and so that is a new code that we're going to be starting to disseminate and encourage and um, journals are going to start evaluating and potentially implementing. And so these are the actual open science badges that you might be familiar of. And this is a, gr a great opportunity for researchers to show, hey, here's all my materials, here's all my registration, here's all my open materials, they're right there. But then we have these two other things as well. We have papers and supplements. These are not technically badges. I think right now I've just been considering them stamps because they're a little bit different. Badges are ones that have been openly adopted by journals thus far and some of the other partners where papers and supplements have not, but it's a really key piece of information that we want to make sure that we can disseminate out there. Um, for example, open publication is one that's a really big incentive. We want to encourage that. So we wanted to give them the stamp of papers. Um, for example, you can also do publication DOI. If you have a DOI, great. Um, if it's not a DOI and something different, you can do it there as well. And there will be a point where we will be migrating all publication DOIs to papers, but that will be in a future release. And then lastly, we have supplements. There are so many different materials that are generated from a research project, and most of them can be put in one of these top four items. But, you know, if, if you're a psychologist, you always need to put in that other thing because there's something that you don't expect. So we have supplements as a kind of a, a catch-all if it does not fit into some of these. And you can find those exactly what that criteria and what those examples are in our help guides, as well as in one of our OSF projects that I'll be disseminating in the email when I send out this recording. That way, if you're not familiar with these criteria, you'll be able to have that resource right in front of you. And you can share that among all your research teams and your other collaborators. Um, not only can you find these on the registration itself, but if you go as a researcher and you want to see exactly what types of registrations do you have your materials on, you can go to my registrations, um, which is a great uh, house for you to scan through all your registrations all at once uh, without having to go through each individual project. So I'm not sure if this is well known uh, with your researchers, but if people are saying I have a hard time finding my registrations and projects, stuff like that, this is a great way to just filter out those registrations. But Here's a great example. If I have barriers and facilitators to adolescents, et cetera, I can see that I have a badge for each one of these. So I can see that this is a, my registration is applying to open science best practices and I'm keeping my things open and transparent with the community because I want people to trust my research. Down here with my sugar concentration and taste preference, I can see that I'm not doing such a good job as a open research advocate. I don't have anything linked down here. So this is a great way for me to kind of scan on through saying, where am I being compliant and where am I not being compliant? Or where am I practicing my open science best practices and where am I not? So as a researcher, it's a great way to kind of gauge that. And then lastly, let's say that I am a, another kind of researcher kind of want to say like, I want to see exactly what's out there and who already has data that I can kind of build up on, either replicate or expand beyond. And the best way to do that is to search through our OSF registries um, dashboard. So to do that, you'll click registries and I'm going to cheat and just click enter. And you can easily see how you can scan through all of these different ones. Forgive the titles. Like I said, this is staging. So this is where we kind of play with it just to make sure things are working. But I can see like this registration, which is mine. I'm being great. And I have all my badges and stamps. I'm being a great advocate for open research. This one, I can see that if I just want to look for data, this one doesn't have data, but he does have code, he does have materials. So it's a great opportunity to see exactly which of these research teams, which of these contributors are actually practicing open science to the best of their availability and those who I can kind of connect with and build upon to really kind of make sure that we have open like access to those resources and really streamline scientific progress. So, just want to make sure we guys get this little sneak peek about what's coming on down the line. So that way you can either find ways that be able to implement this within your workflows or see how these may um, refine some of your workflows. We want to give you guys a little bit of heads up about this. And this is slated to be released on August 29th. So not next Monday, but the following Monday. And with that, I'll stop sharing and ask if anyone has any questions. And we don't have any Q and A questions too, so hopefully that's a that means that it was easy, super helpful, and everything else. Um, I would actually like to ask you guys a couple of questions, and you don't have to answer them now because I'll probably end up asking them in the email. 
But here at the product team, we really want to make sure that we are accomplishing your goals, your needs, and best best bit will support you as you want, want to try to get your research teams to be compliant and practice open research and be able to gather those materials. So some of the questions that you'll be seeing from us is how do badges and these resources potentially affect your, uh, your workflows, whether or not it is something that's helpful, something that might be a hindrance. We want to know about that so we can best support you. Same thing, what are some of the benefits that you might see of this new feature? And potentially also, what are some of these concerns? So you may not have to think of something right off the top of your head, but as you start implementing these or you start leveraging some of these, just let us know and we'll be happy to connect. And since we don't have any questions or anything else, I guess we'll, we can go ahead and end on early. So thanks everyone, greatly appreciate it. And you'll be hearing from me shortly. Thanks.